Good evening and welcome to Special Assignment. I'm your host, Ashraf Garda. In this week's episode, we bring you part two of our story on securitization. The practice by South African banks to bundle consumer debt, such as mortgage and vehicle loans, and reselling them to third parties known as special purpose vehicle or entities, who later trade them on the stock exchange for massive profits. In most cases, this is done without the knowledge of the client. In part one, we revealed how some local banks continue to present themselves as the legal holders of these loans, even though legally they lose this right after reselling the loans. Tonight we investigate why banks are allegedly telling their clients who want access to their original documents that they have lost them in a fire. Some allege that this is aimed to hide the fact that they sold the loans. We also explore the relationship between the banks and these special purpose entities. This investigation by Peter Moyo. This is Mokuna Farm, a chicken business just outside Johannesburg. At full capacity, this farm can hold over 120,000 chickens. It was started by this Spenoni couple six years ago. However, the couple is now on the brink of financial ruin. I'm here to understand how this fairy tale could have what seems to be a potentially tragic ending. We started the business in 20, uh, 2007. EPSA gave us a loan to build these chicken houses. And uh, 2010, we had a problem because of uh, we didn't have contracts. There was lack of contracts, and there was politics in the area that didn't want to give us contracts to grow chickens. Then EPSA started with the liquidation process to liquidate Makuna Farm. Though the farm is valued at six million rands, the couple is being sued for 14 million rands at the South Houteng High Court. They say they are not going down without a fight in a case stretching back three years ago. We then opposed the liquidation order in 2010. Uh, when we opposed, we fought against the liquidation and we won the, the, the case. The judge actually threw the case out. From 2010 to now, we still have politics with growing chicken and the producers are not paying us properly. However, the court battle has added to their financial wars. Herman Narancona is putting the blame squarely on the bank, which he accuses of not giving them backup support. They never come one day to farm to say, as a black farmer going through all this, where we can assist them to make them to come up, to see them to be with us. But it's only a talk. In reality, nothing. Take it me as an example, the way they push me to the ground. Tomorrow I don't know where I'm going to be, uh, you know. But overall, if you see, it's not my fault. Now deserted by their legal team for non-payment, a provisional liquidation order against them was granted this year. However, something was missing. My attorney requested for original uh, agreement documents from EPSA yeah. to say that uh, where is the original fire. documentation. And EPSA was always saying that there was a fire, they are a paperless organization, and there's a, there was a fire in their premises and they have a press report that was in 2009. This is the press release handed in as evidence in court by APSA of a fire at DocuFile, a company where many banks store their legal contract documents. DocuFile, which is based in Midrand, is subject to similar claims in many court cases involving banks across the country. This is where APSA claims to have lost the Mokuna Farm's original documents. Special assignment has seen dozens of affidavits like this one, where various banks claim to have lost documents in a fire. Each time they fail to produce original documents. We approach DocuFile to answer the following questions to shed more light on the existence of the fire. Was there a fire at DocuFile on August 28, 2009? Was the fire reported to the police and if so, what is the case number? Why were these important documents not stored in a fireproof facility? After a number of engagements with DocuFile, it declined our request for an interview. In their written response, they say, with reference to your request to have the below questions answered, we again confirm that due to aspects of confidentiality, DocuFile is unable to assist you as this would breach our confidentiality obligations. As a banker, they should have prepared to keep these documents because these are documents of original status were supposed to be kept in a separate place, not where fire can get in. Because if you put it in a safe and you burn out the building, Everything in the safe is still intact. 
Special assignment has not been able to find a case number related to the fire, although ABSA insists that the fire did okay, but it did not provide further information. They keep an electronic copy on and off site. Um, and if there is a fire, I would like to ask the banks to please tell me how documents become destroyed in fireproof cabinets. Um, I would like to, I've not, I've requested, but I've not received the insurance documentation for the, um, the fire that raged in 2009. I've also not received the case number for the fire that raged in 2009. Mm -hmm. I've also drawn to the attention that at the very least they could contact the registering conveyances for the mortgage bond facilities mm -hmm. and procure the documentation there. I still don't have any responses on that. The story of the missing contract documents has been playing out in the courts. Important to note is that a bank cannot submit a certificate of balance to the courts without the original documentation when it applies for a default judgment against the consumer. A certificate of balance is supposed to show how much the consumer owes at the time of their default, and this is calculated from the original balance in the original contract. Our investigation has discovered hundreds of default judgments are being given by the courts in favor of the banks with no original documents being presented. I would like to ask the judiciary, how many original agreements have they seen lately? Because I have not seen one original agreement. And there are matters, thousands of matters before the courts. And one of the requirements is that when you sue or when you file papers at the court, those documents must be in the original. And it is enforced against the consumers and the defendants. And so should it be enforced against the plaintiffs, which are the credit providers in this case, or the banks. This seems to be the issue in the case of Mokuna Farm, where APSA already has a provisional order without having finished the court with the original agreement. The judiciary must understand that it is, they are supposed to be the champions of the legislation and of the constitution. And where the consumer's rights are being infringed, they need to apply their minds to the papers and where they see that the documentation falls short, they should dismiss the cases. The case of lost or missing documents is not unique to South Africa, as seen in this CNN video from the United States of America. Last month alone, more than 70,000 families lost their homes. Foreclosures jumped a staggering 158% year over year. So can the little guy fight back? Well, Greg Hunter thinks so. I think they can. In foreclosure, the bank has to show it owns your house. But what most people don't know is almost half the time, the banks don't have that paperwork to prove it in court. In many cases, it ends up lost or destroyed. It's a national problem that the banks would love to keep quiet because knowing that could be your best defense in fighting foreclosure. Henny Dibia, a former bank executive, says it is highly impossible for a bank to lose documents as legal contracts sum up the main business of any financial institution. The bank itself keeps uh, records uh, uh, of those uh, contracts uh, in their own uh, servers. Should anything happen to the original contract, the electronic copy can be obtained. Uh, normally, uh, hard copies are kept for three years after the contract has expired. Uh, Docufile goes a step further. They keep these electronic copies for an indefinite period. So if a bank says that they cannot get all of a contract, uh, I'd take to differ. Would you say maybe the banks are lying? I wouldn't say they're lying. I would say it's a very poor excuse. What should a consumer do when faced with this problem? Uh, South African banks are known as of the best in the world. And those aspects are all being covered by these rating agencies. Um, so yes, no, no. If you're a customer and they say this, the contract is lost, it burnt out in a fire, don't accept it. In a moment, bank records go missing. Find out more. Everybody should put the lender to the task of establishing that it owns the debt that it claims that you owe to it. Uh, the wording is actually the mortgage note has either been lost or destroyed and the plaintiff is unable to state the manner in which this has occurred. They're admitting that they lost or destroyed the note. Well, obviously that's the, most ex you know, the best sign available that the lender doesn't have the note mortgage any longer.
So if you see that, or if you want to just try produce the note strategy, what's the first thing you should do? Request that that instrument be produced to you. Once that's served on the lawyer representing the plaintiff, the plaintiff's lawyer has got to respond within 30 days with the document requested. If it does not, then the consumer needs to go to court and ask the court to compel the plaintiff to produce that document. Today, Morgas and Hema are back in court in their last ditch attempt to save their farm. They are shocked to discover that their case against Absa appears under a different name on the court's roll. You know what I'm saying? This is ours. So the provisional booking, the provisional was given on, on under, Absa. under Absa in yes. April, when in February already it was already saying FFS. Yes, yes. Using a hidden camera, they set out to find answers. Okay, so, why FFS and EPSA? What is the difference? What is the difference? Yes, because oh, then you must also write an affidavit explaining to the court that that is your attorney. Yes. Like in the court file, they find, yo, we have got an agreement with an EPSA, but now you find that there's an FFS which is involved. Yes. Then they must explain yeah. how does it now. Not any more upset than this FFS. Yeah, because all your court papers are showing FFS, so there must be some sort of information that the applicant has given to you to capture. That's what I'm, yes. yeah, just do that. Yes. Court documents pertaining to their case, including their opposing affidavits, are also missing from the court's file. The court official is struggling to explain. That is, I don't know how the first one came in. Yeah. Second. Somebody jumped out. Somebody jumped out. Just hand it in court. You no, know, tell the court. No, you find that you, 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 you're opposing the affidavit. But you're so, you don't know how it gets lost in the court file. That's what I'm saying that your, your attorney must give you a copy mm -hmm. and then make another copy okay. and then bring another copy and then keep, keep the, uh, the other one with you. And then on the date of appearance, bring your copy so that if the judge finds that there's something missing from this file, then you can hand in mm. the court. Okay. Okay. And that's the advice I can give you. Okay. Okay. We find very strange because FFS Financial South Africa is not known to us. We don't know. We only all our paperwork and our documentation based on what my old attorney was saying was only EPSA. Where this came into it? I've got no idea. So I think there is something funny going on. And for documents to disappear from the files, records, and from the court, for the court not to produce, all, there were only two documents which was very strange to us. But who is FFS Finance South Africa? APSA claims that FFS is Ford Financial Services, which dealt with Mokuna Farms vehicle purchase. But in court documents in our possession, the name stated is FFS Finance South Africa and not Ford. So what is the link between APSA and FFS Finance South Africa? In its annual report of 2009, APSA claims to own 50% of a company known as FFS Finance South Africa Proprietary Limited. Could this be one and the same company indicated in court documents? Uh, then I would say APSA has got no legal right over Mokuna Farm. What they are now processed, they are processing with liquidation and they have no legal right to process because they are not the owners of, they haven't lent us money. They've sold a right out to somebody if that has happened. The SPV is clearly not a bank. It doesn't trade as a bank, okay? Now, therefore, it cannot accept session of those rights because it, it, it cannot maintain those agreements as a bank, it can maintain those agreements as a credit provider. Meanwhile, another story is brewing on the horizon. I am currently on my way to Deep River in Cape Town, where I'm due to meet uh, a couple who have been battling one of the major banks uh, for the past five years. What is interesting is that they woke up only to be sued by a, a company they had never known about before, which claimed that the home loan they had taken with uh, First National Bank was actually ceded to them. So they might actually be the first couple to have challenged the local standing of that special purpose vehicle and actually got judgment against that uh, um, company. Coming up next, a consumer takes on a bank and wins.
For many years, Zofa Samsodin and her husband Adio Abrams dreamt of owning their own home. And I used to pass this house every day and I used to admire it so much. And then when I heard that it was for sale, and that's how we bought the house because I just fell in love with it. Like most South Africans, they could not afford a cash sale, so they approached a bank for a bond. In 2005, we approached the bank, it was absurd. And then a year later, in 2006, we switched to FMP because we got a better rate there. However, Adil's construction business failed, putting a strain on the family's income. It was not long before the trouble started in paradise. And then in 2007, we defaulted. 2008, they came for summary judgment. Something was different about the court action. A totally new company, Ikaya RMBS2, appeared on the application for summary judgment. What had happened to First National Bank? It was such a shock to us because, first of all, the mortgage bond that we have on the houses, we thought was with FNB. But when they brought the notice for summary judgment, then we saw that it was Ikaya RMBS2. And we had no idea who they were. Because we didn't sign any agreement with him for this house. So who is Ikaya RMBS2 Limited? Ikaya is a special purpose entity that specializes in buying debt through a process of securitization. In this case, FMB, which is known as the originator, had sold its assets, in this case Zufa's bond to Ikaya, mostly done without the client's knowledge. Zufa's loan is then bundled together with other loans and then traded on the stock exchange where people are invited to invest. Zufa only knew of this during the court proceedings. Robin Zimmerman, a consumer law expert, believes this falls foul of the Consumer Protection Act. It's, it seems as though everything is concealed. And in terms of Section 42, when the nature of that title is concealed and it can be deemed a fraudulent scheme, most banks and credit providers have long relied on a session clause like this one found in each credit contract to seed or sell these agreements without having to inform the consumer. However, a National Credit Act expert says this clause is unlawful when run against section 40 and 89 of the Act. Now the issue that we have there is that if I enter into a credit agreement with a bank, and that bank seeds that credit agreement or a whole bunch of credit agreements to a, to a special purpose vehicle, an SPV. Yeah. And in terms of the session clause that, we're, that they're relying upon, they don't have to inform you, then how do you as a consumer know what your rights and obligations are and know who you owe the money to? Furthermore, the fact that the sale from FNB to Ikaya was concealed from the consumer also flows Section 69 of the National Credit Act. And those sections I referred to require that they, the credit providers report any transfer of rights, any sessions, anybody entering into the credit agreement must be reported to the national credit regulator and more particularly to the, to the, to the national register that must be established so that there can be a record of what, of what credit agreements are held by whom and to whom the monies are owed to. However, the case went before Judge Musa at the Cape High Court in 2008. I had to represent myself, and that was in front of Judge Musa. We dismissed that judgment. She won. Judge Musa found the summons to be fatally defective. Crucially, in his ruling, the judge could not find a link between FNB and the special purpose entity, Ikaya, as well as the consumer who had initially only signed a bond agreement with FNB. They were unable to prove a causal nexus. They were unable to prove that they were the lawful holders of the facility. Mm -hmm. And as such, uh, Judge Musa uh, dis uh, refused summary judgment on the matter. I was happy about that judgment because I knew that the judge had judged correctly on that thing because I didn't sign anything with Ikaya. I signed documents with FNB. 
for all intents and purposes, yes. if you follow the chain, um, all, the, all the documentation that we receive is from First National Bank. Even the, um, the, pers the person that, that deposes to the affidavit, I think it was Robert Freeborough in this case, is an employee of the bank. He delivers affidavits on many other cases for First National Bank. Um, in these matters, however, he uh, represented himself as an employee of, of Ikaya as well. So I don't know what the situation is with respect to that. In the papers, they also state that um, the bank acts as agents on behalf of um, on behalf of Ikaya, which is not legally permissible in terms of Section 78 of the Banks Act. This is the court that set a precedent in 2008 on matters of securitization, specifically on the right to sue or foreclose once a debt has been sold on by the banks. In case 6429 stroke 2008 between Ikaya, a special purpose entity, and Zufa, a First National Bank uh, bondholder, uh, Justice Musa found that there was no link or nexus could not be established between the two. Ikaya had previously bought the bond account from First National Bank in 2007. The application for summary judgment was thus dismissed. What basically the judge is saying here is that there is no relationship, legally or otherwise, between the consumer and these special purpose entities that go on to buy debt from these banks. After the judgment, Zufa went ahead to apply for debt review. The review was granted on behalf of FNB, even though it had lost all legal standing due to its securitization transaction with Ikaya. Meanwhile, Ikaya continued with its court case, bringing several applications against Zufa, even though she says she had continued to honor her debt review obligations. They applied for sequestration proceedings against the consumer and they won those proceedings, um, which is a complete travesty of justice, having, having been shown before that they were unable to prove a causal nexus. So we are taking that matter on appeal. They have been taking money from my account to distribute to Ikaya or FNP, I don't know who they give the money to. And, but I've been sequestrated. So who is the money actually then now going to? Because sequestration stops everything. But I was advised to carry on paying. So how does the same court that had found no relationship between the consumer, in this case Zofa, and the special purpose entity grant a sequestration order on behalf of Ikaya five years later. Zufa and her husband have enlisted Robin services to help with their appeal which is due in early September. First National Bank disputes Zufa's version of this story but states that the matter is sub judicare. What we felt throughout our whole experience from 2008 till before we met our new attorney is that nobody believed us to look at this case properly and to see that there were a lot of flaws in it. We struggled to get people to believe us. They just didn't want to. I don't know if it was out of ignorance or just the fact that they couldn't be bothered with us. Soon we'll bring you the third installment in the securitization series where a whistleblower reveals what they claim to be lack of monitoring processes at the Reserve Bank. And hopefully the banks mentioned in this program will take up our invitation to participate in that final series. Now in the meantime, what are your views and experiences with regard to securitization? If you are tweeting, use the hashtag special assignment. You also have the option to Facebook us or to email us. Well, that's it for this week. Join us again next time when we point out the issues that matter.